I would like for you all to imagine your ideal vision of the home landscape. And the picture I'm going to show you now isn't my ideal vision, but it is the most common version of the home landscape today. It usually consists of an expanse of lawn with a tree and some shrubs around the foundation. And this is really the assembly line version of the landscape, really meant to maximize uh, uniformity between homes and minimize costs. But one of the drawbacks of this type of uh, landscape is it almost never contains plants that are native to the area, and it generally requires regular inputs of pesticides and fertilizers for its maintenance. And since Americans now maintain 40 million acres of lawn today, the inputs of these chemicals can have some impacts that you might not even imagine. So I would like to show you some alternative visions of the home landscape that can show you perhaps what these negative impacts are and how they can be minimized and show you that it might be time to come up with a new vision of the home landscape. I'd like to first show you this aerial perspective of the landscape because I think this view illustrates that individual yards actually form islands of habitat. And these individual backyards actually connect to each other, forming highways of green space that organisms like bees and butterflies move through in search of resources. And it's precisely this constant movement of organisms through the landscape that provides an individual homeowner the opportunity to have a positive impact on the wildlife. And the greatest part about this is that it requires almost no effort on your part and really no expenditure of money. By simply not applying chemical pesticides, you can actually avoid unintentional harm to wildlife as they move outside of nearby green spaces like parks and preserves. This is a nighttime perspective on the home landscape, and this is one of my favorite times in the garden. And I think it's a great time in the garden for kids as well to form memories like chasing fireflies. If you're lucky enough to still have fireflies in your garden, then you still have an intact food web in your landscape. And why we know that is because these fireflies spend the majority of their time below ground in the soil as larvae. And so homeowners that spray chemical pesticides on their lawns, these fireflies are one of the first species to disappear. And when these fireflies come above ground as adults, their role in the food web is a predator. So they play a beneficial role in your landscape by searching out and finding snails and slugs and removing those. So homeowners that decide to spray chemical pesticides many times uh, kill the good with the bad. And so therefore you end up leaving your landscape uh, in a dark place at night. This is a child's perspective on the home landscape. And one of the reasons I'm showing this is because now we know that healthy children are dirty children and that children benefit by being out in the yard, getting dirty and exposing themselves to many microorganisms. This helps build them a healthy immune system. But for homeowners that spray their backyard uh, with chemicals, this can become a toxic place, particularly for kids. And it's in part because of what you see here. Children have a lot more skin contact with the lawn than do adults. And they have internal organs that are less capable of removing those pesticide loads once they're in their body. And we assume also that these pesticides stay outside in the landscape, but what we found is that lots of uh, foot traffic allows a lot of these chemicals to come inside on the floors, again, where children are more um, subject to those chemicals. So we know the lawn care labels say that these pesticides like 2,4-D are toxic when they're touch skin, when they touch the eyes, and you're supposed to wash immediately once you're exposed to them. And we also know that individuals who work for a living to spray these chemicals uh, for lawn care companies are required by the EPA to wear gear that covers almost all exposed surfaces of their bodies. But then we're told that it's completely safe uh, to send your family out to play on it as soon as those chemicals are dry. It's not possible to set up experimental tests on our children to test the effects of these lawn care chemicals. But what individuals at the Purdue College of Veterinary Medicine have done is run studies on our pets. 
to see what those effects are. And the results are disturbing in that uh, our house pets that are exposed to these lawn care chemicals on a regular basis have up to seven times the incidence of bladder cancer as opposed to those pets uh, that aren't exposed to sprayed yards. They also show uh, that these pets are very effective at bringing those pesticide loads into the home. But we know that our pets are not the only animals that are affected by our lawn care chemicals. There's many animals that are also affected. The bees would be a, a important one to mention because they've been declining significantly recently. And particularly because of pesticides, they get a one-two punch in the environment. They pick up pesticide loads from all the vegetation they're visiting, but they also can't find resources to forage. When you're killing all the flowers, uh, they literally can't find enough food and starve. And this combination of factors we now call colony collapse disorder in the bees. Monarchs are a species of butterfly uh, that has suffered a lot also recently. And in fact, populations of monarchs have declined by 90% in the last uh, 20 years. And it's in part because their reproduction depends upon finding the plant that you see in this slide, which is the milkweed. Native populations of milkweed have declined significantly, so in order to reproduce, uh, the monarch has to find this plant in order to lay its eggs and the larva to develop on this particular plant. But it also makes a great opportunity for the homeowner who's interested in planting native species to host this milkweed flower in their yards and increase those populations. Perhaps surprisingly, songbird populations have also been on the decline, despite the fact that we love to feed the birds. I think the disconnect there comes from what we think the birds need to eat. And while those birds do love the seeds out of your feeder, in order to successfully raise their young, almost all songbirds must forage for insects and find those to feed um, the babies. The types of plants that they find the most insects on are always native plants compared to non-natives. But more often than not, when homeowners pick plants to plant in their home landscape, they're choosing uh, species like the Bradford pear, a native of Asia. The Bradford pear was introduced to the horticultural trade in the 1960s because of its uh, beautiful flowering display in the spring and insect resistance. And at the time, it was sterile, so it thought it, they thought it could never escape into the wild. But in the 1980s, they introduced other varieties of pear and these began to cross-pollinate, and suddenly across the nation, Bradford pears started producing tons of berries and then moving into our wild landscapes. So in places across the U.S., including along University Parkway, in the springtime, you can see all of these Bradford pears growing in thorny, dense stands to the point where they're so thick that they're actually crowding out our native species in the wild. So they've become sort of the classic example of these non-natives becoming invasive. It's not as if we don't have beautiful native species to substitute for these non-natives. This is our own Indiana native, uh, the serviceberry, about the same size as the Bradford pear, again, beautiful flowering display in the spring, and produces tons of fruit that the birds love. So if you're interested when you go to buy a plant uh, in choosing some natives, the Indiana Native Plant and Wild Wildflower Society has wonderful online resources to make excellent choices of natives for your garden. And you can, in our own nurseries here in town, find a reasonable selection of these native plants. You usually need to be going with a list, though, of what you're thinking of. You can even find some selections in the big box stores of some native species, and I'll show you a few of those. So if you're now interested in rethinking your landscape, I wanted to show you just a few examples of what that might look like. So here is a lawn that's been greenscaped, and that's just sort of a fancy way of saying these people aren't using pesticides on their lawn. And it involves just a few adjustments on your part. One of those things that you need to think about is raising uh, the lawn deck on your lawnmower so you can grow the grass slightly taller and the grass is healthier, and then it's naturally outcompeting the weeds. The other thing you need to consider is to mulch those clippings back into the lawn so that you're not constantly taking the nutrients out of the soil. And finally, you have to learn to tolerate just a few species other than one grass. And the one I have pictured here is probably the most important for a healthy lawn, which is white clover. 
This species was intentionally included in grass seed mixes until relatively recently. The white clover is in the bean family, and as a result, it has the capability of fixing nitrogen in the roots and in naturally enriching the soil. And it provides great food for the bees. Here's a few examples uh, of plants that you can put into your landscaping beds if you have a place to plant flowers. I've included these two natives because I've bought both of these personally from big box stores in town, so I know they're available. And generally, they're marked on the pots as native. The pink flower is the purple cone flower, and it's a prairie native. And I like to recommend this one for people that are trying out natives for the first time because it's hard to kill. Uh, it loves our thick clay soils, and once it's established, it is uh, almost unnecessary to water. The plant on the right, which has uh, just grass, like leaves at, at this point, is called the Arkansas Blue Star. It has so many positive features, it was named the perennial plant of the year in 2011. Because in the springtime, it is covered with a cloud of blue flowers. You're seeing it now in the summer with three foot tall mass of uh, leaf of uh, grass-like vegetation. But in the fall, it turns a brilliant golden yellow providing three full seasons of interest in your garden. And if this is not enough, this plant is in the milkweed family, so it produces a milky, distasteful sap that no deer will eat. And finally, if you have some places in your landscape that just won't grow grass very well, you might be interested in thinking beyond the lawn. This is one particular spot around a patio that didn't grow grass well in the first place. So the simplest solution in this relatively small spot was just to remove the turf, anchor the slope with some field stones, and plant perennials and shrubs. So what I want to leave you with, beyond just these ideas to get you started in the landscape, is the most common objection uh, people bring to me when they're considering this, which is, what are my neighbors going to think? And so really, I have to tell you what they've shared with me as they come uh, to my yard. And it's not to complain to me to use more poisons. It's, it's always, where did you get that plant? Uh, how do I grow it? And could you please just come to my yard and do this at my house? And so I think very soon, the conversation is going to switch from how do we kill more things in our landscape to how do I attract more wildlife like bees and butterflies and birds and bring the, bring the landscape alive. And thank you very much for your time today.